Hello, everyone. Welcome back to API Days Live Singapore. We, uh, we're starting off this, uh, this track here on the industry stage is what we're calling the, the connected industry. And what better way, what, what a better industry to connect than communications. So I'm going to invite uh, Thomas LeBoule and uh, Chip Wilcox to, um, to present uh, their topic, which is, uh, which is very relevant to how we, we uh, communicate with our customers, um, particularly in uh, this mixed environment in Southeast Asia where uh, at times connectivity is very good and sometimes it's quite patchy. So um, please, uh, please welcome Thomas and Chip. Thank you, John. Yeah. Very happy to be here. And thank you everyone for joining this communication session. So Chip and I are both part of a Singapore-based CPaaS player called Toku. And we want to use today's session to talk a bit more about the emerging ch challenges for the industry and the way we believe the different players uh, should address them. Yeah. Thank you, Thomas. And before we start, um, let's briefly introduce Toku and ourselves. So Thomas is the founder and CEO of Toku. And Chip is the head of product. And interestingly enough, uh, I was actually introduced to him during the API Days conference last year in Amsterdam. So uh, one other reason to attend these conferences is really the networking portion that was, in our case, uh, very relevant. So let's talk a little bit more about Toku. So Toku is a cloud communications platform for businesses in Asia. We're a licensed telecommunications operator in Singapore. And we build solutions that facilitate customer engagement across different communication channels and systems. Besides the provisioning of business telephony solutions and APIs for programmable voice and messaging with customers like Gojek and Decathlon, we also support digital transformation of traditional businesses and their customer engagement channels. This includes assisting customers with replacement of legacy systems, where it's important to manage a mix of on-premise and cloud-based systems, as well as the integration of communication flows with automation and operational tools like CRMs and customer support platforms. And talking about digital transformation, we are releasing an integration with Microsoft Teams later uh, this quarter. So if you want to know more about us and about what we do, don't hesitate to reach out and to visit our website. So. Let's talk a little bit about what we can expect from this presentation. First, we'll cover the background of today's topic and share a few of our own observations about the industry that we're in. We'll talk about a few challenges that CPaaS players and the industry currently face. And then once that baseline has been set, we'll present how to address those challenges. We'll talk about some lessons we've learned, what we think some key success factors are, and we wanna keep things practical. So we'll also throw in a couple of real world examples. But let's start with uh, some of the background. So this is a high level overview of the telephony journey. And as you can see, most of the groundbreaking technology evolutions are on the slide. And what is important to remember is that the telecommunication industry has always been at the forefront of innovation. Actually, telcos have been at the inception, implementation and monetization of most of the technical evolutions that you see on the slide. But after the introduction of uh, the internet, and especially after the introduction of voice over internet protocols, telcos missed the opportunity to disrupt their business model. And as the saying goes, if you are not ready to cannibalize yourself, someone else will. And that's how OTTs, CPaaS players, and eventually UCAS players began to take over some of the traditional telco business in the early 2000s. Right, and as Thomas says, voice over IP and to a further extent, the recent standardization and the rapidly increasing adoption of APIs have all contributed to this rise of communications as a service. Businesses also needed to manage their communications in a more flexible way, choosing to forgo high CapEx investments and in on-premise installations in favor of hosted solutions. This is another thing that wasn't really understood by most telcos. And this opened up a greenfield opportunity, as we say, for communications as a service players with platforms. That's the communications platform as a service and the unified communications 
as a service players. And these companies started to take over the enterprise communications market. When you talk about CPaaS, there's also been an evolution and different stages of this particular variation on communications. With CPaaS 1.0, what we saw were standalone non-telco businesses offering APIs that gave developers the ability to send and receive SMS or make and receive voice calls over the public switch telephone networks. Basically, API enabling regular telephones. A couple of years later, there was a new standard for adding real-time communications with audio, video, and messaging to web and mobile apps. You might remember WebRTC, and there was some hype around that. And these capabilities were also added to the CPaaS toolset. All of this allowed developers to bring communication features into the context of pretty much any user experience. And again, most traditional telcos sat on the sidelines. They might have been at the table for development of the standards, but they treated CPaaS as an experiment or even a side hustle rather than seeing it as a large commercial opportunity. Mm -hmm. And today we're headed towards yet another step in this evolution. So CPaaS 3.0, if we can call it that, is where we take all these communication services and extend or integrate those capabilities into a much broader range of business tools and processes beyond simple API offerings to help drive customer engagement and support true digital transformation. The question still remains though, where are the telcos? Well, the telcos, despite um, missing the, the opportunity uh, in the early 2000s, and the rise of communication as a service model have still managed to remain relevant. And this for three reasons. First of all, their brand awareness is very strong. Enterprise customers usually know all the national telcos, but will not know the mainstream CPaaS players, or at least not those that are um, not involved in, in the API ecosystem. So their brand awareness is definitely a plus. Secondly, they are also involved with the regulators. They have a long established relationship and it might not be as relevant in markets like North America or the European Union, but in Asia Pacific, where there is a, a strong fragmentation of uh, the different markets, it is crucial to have a good relationship with uh, the regulators. But what is really making the difference and allowing telcos to remain relevant is the fact that everything is dependent on them. Let me explain. Ultimately, they are the gatekeepers to your phone, to your fixed line. The way the whole infrastructure is set up, the way it technically works, it means that no native SMS or voice call can reach you unless the telco to which you are subscribed allows it. So it's really a funnel like you can see here on the slide. And that's important for them to remain relevant and that's why there is a strong dependency on these traditional operators and alongside that as you might expect with maturing industries all over the place this change in provisioning methods is reducing the need for multiple inter intermediaries and the industry has actually been consolidating horizontally and vertically over the last few years and that consolidation has started accelerating in the last 12 to 15 months as companies look to fill gaps in their portfolios, they realize they need to catch up, they need to extend their reach beyond markets like the US and the EU, M&A happens. And here are just a few examples on this slide of how that's affected the industry. The one that is most notable for us, perhaps in Singapore, is that WaveCell, which was an SMS CPaaS company here, was acquired by 8x8, which is a publicly listed UCAS player in the United States, ostensibly because they wanted to get some reach in Asia and they weren't gonna be able to do it by themselves. Even with all this activity, the API economy itself is still in its infancy and not everyone has even heard of APIs, let alone the term CPaaS. So let's talk about how we see CPaaS adoption for a minute and set up the next part of our talk. Correct, because now that you are more familiar with the supply, let's talk about the demand side. So we categorized um, and divided the enterprise customers in, in three, um, three buckets. First of all, the API natives. So these are typically companies that were launched after the introduction of uh, VOIP and the strong adoption of the internet in general. They are typically part of the sharing economy, meaning that their entire business is online. 
So we are thinking about ride hailing companies, food delivery, e-commerce, and so on. So by, by nature, by design, they were built with anything as a service providers, and they have very light assets. So for them to integrate APIs, well, it's simply part of how they operate. They were built like that. The next segment that we talk about is what we call API savvy businesses. There are several really massive industries that have gradually transformed the way they operate and how they respond to new customer expectations. And they're doing this by adopting APIs. This often goes hand in hand with the move from on-premises services to cloud hosted deployments. And I think of sectors like healthcare, financial services and banking, education, as examples of this, and not just for healthcare telemedicine or not just e-learning for education. We're talking about sector-wide adoption. So as you can see from what, what Chip just said and then comparing it to the API natives, the bulk of the economy is actually still very much offline and has not adopted so strongly all the APIs. So you have the sectors that uh, Chip just pointed out, which are already um, starting to do that because there is such a huge potential. And then you have also a very large portion of the economy that is entirely offline. Uh, we are talking here about industries that are so specific in their use cases that many of their um, IT developments were custom made. They have to deal with a lot of legacy systems as well. So they, they, might, they, may, they are maybe aware of uh, the APIs, but they are not sure how to start to implement them. And that is a really big opportunity as well. So we are talking about shipping and logistics, traditional manufacturing, and uh, construction. Right. So, of course, we've highlighted a lot of opportunities on the demand side for CPaaS, but our space still has some challenges we need to address. So now that we've covered the background of the industry, We'll see how being new and disruptive at inception at inception doesn't necessarily mean you can stay that way. You always have to alter your course to maintain your momentum. And the way businesses engage with customers and the way that's changing means that plenty has shifted and there are some hurdles we need to overcome. The standardization of APIs and their increased adoption by enterprise customers means there's going to be a shift and a commoditization of the initial CPaaS offerings. Usage of APIs for PSTN and SMS services is now so common, and the options for integration are so flexible that switching from one supplier to another is pretty much hassle-free. This evolution has resulted in a very price-driven procurement process for many of the early adopting large API uh, native companies that are now looking to put the supply chain under pressure. And besides the commoditization of uh, CPaaS 1.0, now, as telcos a decade ago, CPaaS players have to face the decision of, are we going to cannibalize ourselves or are we going to wait until someone else is willing to do it? Because you see the phasing out of traditional PSTN and SMS is, of course, a difficult business decision for CPaaS players because these are very lucrative revenue streams that are already established. And transforming from these native telephony solutions towards the in-app and in-browser communications is going to be much more cost-effective for the enterprise customers, which means that there is some cannibalization to do by uh, the CPaaS players. And not only do they have to decide fast, they are also facing the risk that especially the big API native companies are starting to bring some of these early use cases in-house because a lot of the services that uh, were introduced a decade ago are now getting more accessible and are also getting white labeled by some uh, suppliers. So that is the, the second reason why they need to decide fast about how do we handle that cannibalization. And to go on top of all of that, uh, it's become clear that CPaaS players can no longer afford to be specialists within just one of these communication categories. Enterprise customers have gotten more sophisticated and they're also increasingly expecting to provision all of these communication needs from a single supplier. So if you're a CPaaS player, you not only have to have an SMS API, but also the PSTN API. 
Add to that the ability to do in-app chat, messaging, video, or the ability to easily tap into an ever-growing catalog of third-party libraries to support localization, recording and transcription, maybe payment services. They want it all. And this is super exciting for us, but it's a little bit nerve wracking as well. And so now, now that you have a good comprehension of the background supply and demand, but also the challenges that the supply uh, and the suppliers are facing is the question is how do one remain relevant and how do we succeed as CPaaS players in uh, this, this new context? So here are a few of the key success factors that uh, we've identified and we want to share with you. So first of all, as we were discussing about the different categories of demands, the customers that were addressed for the majority of the decade were the API natives. So it's really time to go and widen up the audience, considering especially that the bulk of the economy is actually not part of the API natives. The traditional economy is, is a huge opportunity for the market. And so businesses, CPaaS players, must absolutely start to engage non-API native businesses and address business stakeholders rather than only addressing developers that understand APIs by design. Secondly, digital transformation is not really a buzzword anymore. It is all about overcoming challenges caused by legacy systems, traditional business models, and businesses have actually had the luxury to deploy all kinds of excuses not to do it. But sometimes outside forces make those decisions for you. And here you can see the meme that's been circulating lately around who's led the digital transformation of your company. Was it the CEO, the CTO, or COVID-19? It's really amazing what happens when you tell companies they can't run their businesses anymore due to a healthcare crisis. And I know as tragic as the pandemic may be, we've found at least one silver lining. For companies like us, it provides a great way to help customers adapt and thrive in spite of these challenges, including or in spite of COVID-19. As an example, it makes me feel pretty good that our customer Decathlon transformed their entire contact center literally overnight from a, I go to the office and punch the clock from eight to 4.30 every day to a work from anywhere operation facilitated by the use of a cloud-based telephone system. And we've also seen some new attention given to other good use cases like emergency alerts, crisis communications, all powered by SMS and automated voice calls and integrated with lots of other systems. So ultimately what matters for us is to overcome and remove obstacles for businesses that want to do digital transformation and help facilitate that transition. Adaptability and turnkey solutions are really essential to a continued successful growth strategy. Correct. And at the same time, to address the commoditization of uh, some of the use cases, it's also relevant to shift the discussion from price towards quality of service. Because at the end of the day, uh, having the price for every component is not necessarily relevant for the business stakeholders. What they will ask is, what about the customer experience? What am I paying for? How uh, good is your uh, success rate for delivery? Uh, what is the quality of my voice calls? How do you optimize the different communication flows depending on locations? All these questions uh, must be put on the forefront and not price. Likewise, showing that the customer how you're adding value to their business is part of that discussion as well. Again, as Thomas mentioned, whether it's a better delivery success rate for SMSs, higher conversion rates from leads to customers, better customer engagement rates, higher CSAT scores, whatever you can use to direct the conversation away from the cost is everything motive will help you be successful going forward. And in addition, it's important to adapt your billing model to align with the way customers want to measure their own success as well. Last but not least, what is really making the difference is the ecosystem that you can create. Not only because that's what businesses expect, they don't want to have several providers as we were discussing earlier on with the one-stop solution, but they also want to make sure that there is actually an exchange happening in terms of data between the communication channels and the corporate tools. This is absolutely crucial to address or to start doing contextual communications, smart or smarter customer engagement, so that 
the information is flowing from the communication channels directly into all the corporate tools that you have, like your CRM or your customer ticketing tool. It's really making sure that the business stakeholders are seeing the direct value of it and that you can integrate with all the processes, tools, and services that the company has. So now that we've covered all the success factors, let's um, show you a few of the real life examples um, that, that are directly um, making it more clear what, what we've been uh, talking about. Right. So of course we can talk forever about these things, but real examples are key and, and much more useful. So the first one that I'll talk about is this whole idea of verification. Um, when one-time password authentication and digital verification was first made available, it was generally done by a single channel like SMS, maybe a voice call, but not in combination or by using one as a substitute or fallback for the other. And each of these services were often procured from different vendors, as I've discussed before. Today, there are a few players out there who are actually combining all of these services into a single component or an API, and or at least a recipe for how to implement it. So there's a playbook that they, they can describe and give to almost anyone from any vertical that wants to implement it. CPaaS players can also price these things commercially so that you're paying for the verification itself. You're not paying for two or three SMSs, a code, or a 30 second voice call. It's called a verification and you only pay when it's successful. And this helps businesses understand the value that you're actually delivering to them with this service. Correct. So you're really shifting the conversation that was previously happening when you were addressing developers by saying, look, we have this communication channel, we have this API and this API to up to an absolute use case, to a complete flow. In this case, making sure that your users are getting registered and are getting verified. Similarly, what we've seen uh, from one of our customers, for example, here in Singapore, um, is, is a typical um, typical solution for replacing some of the human interactions that are not really adding value. And in this case, it's about customer support and the time that uh, agents were losing in a coordination that was not optimal for either party because they had to be in between the driver and the passenger to retrieve any lost item, considering that in Singapore, you can, of course, not share the personal details. So they were merely an intermediary. And Gojek came up with um, a bundling of all our APIs, programmable voice, programmable SMS, the number API, in order to create a dedicated hotline for lost and found, which would work with an automated IVR, a digital menu, that will match the driver or the passenger with the relevant ride, and therefore with the second party involved in that transaction, so that they can allocate a virtual number. That virtual number is then creating a temporary and anonymous communication channel, which allows both parties, when they call that number, to be in touch with each other without knowing their actual caller IDs or their actual personal details. And once the retrieval is done, they don't have to bother about the number. The number automatically expires after 12 hours. So really creating that automated, anonymous uh, communication channel that is temporary. So building on that, that's where we see the need for more sophisticated use cases and enhancement. And you can really start doing so by creating the recipes and the playbooks that uh, Chip was, was talking about a minute ago, because that's what businesses need when they are not API natives. They don't need the, just the tools, just the APIs. They really need to know what can we do with that. And the best thing to do is like when a good chef is creating a recipe book, it's providing the guidelines in order to build what you need. Of course, adapted to your industry, but starting from a standard, starting from a real life example from uh, someone else is much easier than starting from a blank page. And to top that off, the other thing that we'll see starting to happen is the enhancement and extension of these types of use cases to integrate with lots of other systems. So, a further evolution of all of this and a way to make your APIs accessible and to make your services more usable is to apply what the low code platform space has been doing for business process automation and coding for applications. 
building visual interfaces to use with APIs that allow you to sort of drag and drop messaging and voice calling functionality into applications and business process flows is really a next step iteration of what we see happening now as part of CPaaS 3.0. Yes, and to, to summarize everything that we said, um, I think it's relevant to remember that uh, telcos have a dependency or create a dependency, better said, and that CPAS must continuously innovate if they don't want to be bypassed themselves 10 years after they started to disrupt the whole industry. And the key success factors for that are really to widen up their audience, focus on quality of service, and create that ecosystem that we were talking about earlier. So I see that John already uh, joined us, so we, we yeah. are probably running out of time. Uh, John, th this is the end of the, the presentation. I don't know if we still have time for a few questions. Um, if there I are think, questions. I think uh, it would be best to let people contact you directly with questions. I would certainly sure, sure. encourage that. Uh, I think you you brought up the, the myriad of possible ways that people, uh, companies can connect with their customers and their internal operations. But as you said, you, um, you really bring that to life when you, when you have a recipe book, uh, when you have some, some patterns that you can apply to, to the customer journey to really make that, that work. So uh, appreciate the, the, the industry view and the uh, how to, certain, certainly APIs are the Lego blocks that you can assemble to uh, uh, to assemble different uh, services, but um, you, you get an insight into how to do that in a, uh, a systematic way that makes sense for both the, the company and, and their customers. So thank you very much. Thank well, you. thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, to everyone attending this session, thank you for your time.